Father, sometimes you allow stuff like this that's happening in our world today to remind us just how weak we are, just how dependent on you we are. And God, these are moments where your people need to claim your promises. These are moments where your people need to declare that you are sovereign, you are on the throne, that this is right in the palm of your hands. That's what, what's happening around us. Though we don't control it, you do. And God, we believe that you love us. We believe that we, we are your children. You've called us into a relationship with you. The proof of this is the cross of your son, Jesus Christ, and the empty tomb. So God, right now, we're standing on your promises. Right now, God, we declare that we have nothing to fear. If we have a God in heaven who's got all of this in the palm of his hand. And so God, this week, help us to live like people that already have victory. It's been purchased for us by the blood of your son, Jesus. God, hear the praises of your people. God, hear our heart. God, hear our prayer. And then God, heed our prayer. And minister to us, Holy Spirit, move in us. And help us to be bold witnesses for you this week. It's in Jesus' name that we pray this. Amen. Thank you, you guys can grab a seat. Thanks for all of you that are joining us online. If you didn't tune in at the beginning and you're just now joining us, my name's Jeff, and uh, this is Two Cities Church, and we are studying through the book of Nehemiah. In fact, we just started a verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Nehemiah last Sunday. And what we're doing over the course of the next couple of months is just going verse-by-verse -verse through the book of Nehemiah. And we're looking at this man and the ministry that God gave him. And today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about prayer. In fact, that's why we spent so much of this morning in prayer already, because I need you to hear something. Those of you that are in this room, those of you that are tuning in on Facebook Live, you need to know that this is a people of prayer. In fact, for a church to be a place of prayer, it must be a people of prayer. Any church that's built on slick programs, if it's just simply awesome music, if that's all that it is, and there's no real prayer in the, in the hearts of the people, then I am convinced that church will really not accomplish much for the kingdom. And so if we're going to be a place of prayer, we're going to have to be people of prayer. And today, you get a chance to see from Scripture a big prayer. You get a chance to see from Scripture a really bold prayer. And so what I want you to do as we get ready to open up the book of Nehemiah is I want you to prepare your hearts for the prayer of this man, Nehemiah, and then I want you to just start to examine your hearts. In fact, I'm going to ask you to do something really unusual today. As we look at the scriptures from Nehemiah chapter 1 today, I want you not so much to focus on the words on the page in front of you. I want you to focus on the heart of the guy who's uttering these words. And I think, like me, you're going to be blown away by the heart of this man that we hear from today. Now, each week, what I try to do is just give you the whole sermon in one succinct sentence. And if you want to know where we're going with this sermon today, here it is on the screen. I realize this is backwards. You guys can look at it through a mirror if you're watching on Facebook Live. But... What the scriptures are going to show us today is big prayers, the bold prayers that are really calling down the power of God from heaven. Those prayers only come from, it's right up here on the screen, y'all. Those prayers only come out of what? A big heart. The bigger the prayer, the bigger the heart. And we have a guy today from the Bible, Nehemiah, who prays big prayers. He prays bold prayers, the kind of prayers that ask big things from God. And the heart is the soil that big prayers come out of. The heart is the forge, and if you want that forge to cause or to create big prayers, that forge is going to have to get white hot. Nehemiah is a guy with a white hot heart, and we're going to start in verse 5 today, and we're going to look at well, actually, we'll start in verse 4, and we're going to look at this man's prayer. 
we're not going to dissect the prayer so much, is look at the man behind the prayer. As I said just a minute ago, to really just look at the heart behind the prayer. And if you're going to be the kind of guy or gal in this room, if you're going to be the kind of guy tuning in who prays these big, bold prayers, then you're going to have to have a heart like we're reading from Nehemiah today. So here's the three things that we're going to take a look at. First, Nehemiah is without a doubt a man with a tender and a soft heart. In fact, his prayer really begins before he even starts to pour his heart out to God. In prayer, he, God is already working inside of his heart. If you didn't tune in last week, we got a chance to see how sin had impacted people that Nehemiah had never met before in his life. Go back to our YouTube channel and check out last week's sermon. Today, Nehemiah is profoundly impacted at the heart level by what he hears of this report from a land that's hundreds of miles away and people that are dozens of years removed, scores of years removed from Nehemiah. And here's what Nehemiah hears today. We're in Nehemiah chapter 1, starting in verse 4. And here's what the Bible tells us. Nehemiah, when he heard what happened in Jerusalem, when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept. I mourned for a number of days fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, I need you to understand this. Before Nehemiah prays anything, before Nehemiah does anything, he sits down and he is broken at the heart level over what he's just heard. In fact, the language on the screens today, I want you to picture this in your mind for just a second, is the kind of language that you would use in Nehemiah's day if the police came knocking on your door last night at 2 o'clock in the morning and said, your wife, your husband, your children have just been killed in a head-on car crash. This is what you would do. This is mourning language, like somebody very close to Nehemiah has just died. It was a custom of the Jews many years ago that when there was a death, a very close death in the family, the people that were closest to this person would sit down on a stool or they would sit down on a pillow and they would spend the next seven days fasting and mourning while the rest of the community came by and paid their condolences. And Nehemiah, here's this report, check this out, from a land that's 900 miles away and from people that he probably has never met in his lifetime. And he is broken like he just got a knock on the door at 2 o'clock in the morning. He says that he sits down in the morning, and this isn't just a one-time event, gets up, dusts himself off, and goes right back to work. No, he stays there. And he stays broken over what he's just heard from Israel. You know, when, when, when you and I get catastrophic news, it will, look up here for a second, it will impact your faith. You see, when something really tragic happens in your life, there's basically two ways that people are going to respond to this, and it's always going to impact your view of God. Sometimes when something really terrible happens in your life, it forces us to do what we just said a minute ago. And to say, God, the circumstances of life are out of my control. I realize that all over again, that I don't decide who lives, who dies, who gets a disease, who doesn't. That's not in my power. And I kind of live like I do, but it's not under my control. So God, I believe that you're bigger than my circumstances. God, I believe that you've got my circumstances or the tragedies of my life in the palm of your hand. Some people, their faith is going to get better because they're forced in these terrible moments to trust in God like they've never trusted in him before. But there are others when something really terrible happens in their life. And this may be you, that your faith gets bitter. And if we can be honest for just a second, I'm not sure what your view of God is if you have this view that God, because I'm a Christian, because I follow you, everything is supposed to be perfect for the rest of my life. Because when something catastrophic happens, and it's going to happen to all of us time and time again, 
You can view God as bigger than your circumstances and able to hold you up in the midst of this trying time, or you can just get bitter about it and decide, God, I'm mad at you. God, I don't like you. God, you didn't deliver for me what I thought you were going to deliver for me. And you're really treating him like he's not God anymore. You're actually treating him like he's a genie. And if I rub the lamp and if I make a wish, you're supposed to give me what I want. And I rub the lamp and you didn't give me my wish. And God, I'm mad about it right now. Nehemiah is devastated over the news in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is a land that he has almost certainly never been to before in his life. Hundreds of miles away and people that he's never met before. And this man sits in the dirt for days, unable to eat, unable to do anything, but just simply pour his heart out because of it. You guys ever have a toy, your precious toy? Maybe for you you guys in the room, it was a remote control car. Maybe for you girls, it was a baby doll. The remote control stopped working. The baby doll, when you pulled the string, it didn't do what it was supposed to do anymore. And now it's in front of you. And now you love this thing, but it's broken. That thing can become a massive sore point for you. And Nehemiah is looking at this city that he's never been to, a city that's that's on his heart, and he's broken over. And what I'm trying to communicate to you right now is that you and I should really have the same heart of Nehemiah over our community, over the spiritual condition of our community. You see, there really is no such thing as Christianity that doesn't care for the city in which God has placed it. It's almost a uh, contradiction in terms. It's like a Christianity without a cross. A Christianity without the heart of Jesus Christ really isn't Christianity altogether. And Nehemiah is showing a heart for people that are far from God and broken because of sin. And it has devastated Nehemiah. When Nehemiah prayed, listen to me, y'all. He already had the heart of God when he starts to pray in verse 6. And he already has the ear of God because Nehemiah has already got the heart of God. And because God has got a hold of Nehemiah's heart, Nehemiah has now got a hold of God's ear. And so I want you to hear this guy. First you see his heart, but now I want you to hear this guy's prayer. When Nehemiah starts to pray, man, this is a bold prayer. In fact, this really is the formula for asking a big prayer of God. Just a moment ago, when I asked you to get together in groups, I asked you, I tried to lead you through basically three things that Nehemiah does here in the next few verses. The first thing that Nehemiah does is he repents of his sin. And if you don't understand what that word repent is, it just simply says, God, I'm sorry, but I am so sorry. It's not just agreeing with God that I, I messed up. God, I'm so sorry that I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to live like this anymore. That's the first thing that Nehemiah does. The second thing that Nehemiah does in this big, bold prayer is that he remembers God's Goodness, God's faithfulness, he remembers in our day the sacrifice of Jesus and remembers this is how much my God loves me. And because my God loves me this much, third thing, now I'm going to ask a bold request of God. I'm going to make a big prayer, a bold prayer. So here's the bold prayer that Nehemiah prays. When he gets up out of the dirt after mourning and fasting for days, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 6, here's what he says. I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant to those who love him and who keep his commands, here's the prayer. Let your ears be open." And let your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer. Your servant, singular, is Nehemiah. And now I pray to you day and night for your servants, servants, plural, Israel, the Israelites. I confess I kept the commands and statutes and ordinances that you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses if 
You are unfaithful. I will scatter you among the people. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizons, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I have chose to have my name dwell. They are your servants, your people. You redeemed them by your great power and by your strong hand. Nehemiah is going to make a big request of God in just a moment. We'll look at this request. But to set this up, every word that Nehemiah says in chapter 1 is basically convinced that God is listening to this prayer. That God is going to hear Nehemiah's prayer. And Nehemiah is convinced God is going to do something with this prayer. Have you ever had those times in your life where you're pouring your heart out to God and you're not even sure if it's making a difference? You're not even sure if God hears what you have to say because you keep saying it over and over again. And I'm not sure if it's making any difference. When Nehemiah prays, he believes this prayer is going to make a difference. And so ne Nehemiah is going to boldly stand on the covenant of God. Now, do you know what this word covenant means? Because Nehemiah is going back into the Old Testament. He's probably reading from the book of, De of Deuteronomy when he prays this prayer because Nehemiah prays words that come almost exactly out of Deuteronomy when Moses is standing before the people of God and Moses is remand or reminding the people of God of God's covenant. God in heaven has decided to come down and to enter into a contract with people. And here's the contract. If you will, listen to these two words. Believe me and obey me, then I will bless you. And I will be your God and I will take good care of you. But if you don't obey me, if you turn from me and to other gods, then all of the curses of this covenant, I'm going to pour out on you. And Nehemiah says, you know what, God, you made that deal with us a long time ago. Our forefathers entered into this agreement with you, and then we broke it. Man, we didn't just break it. We shattered it, and we danced all over the broken pieces of the covenant that you made with us. And God, we really deserve what we got. God, you scattered us from Jerusalem, the promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey. You scattered us to the furthest corners of the earth, is what Nehemiah says to this is the greatest human trafficking in Israel's history. Everyone was scattered literally all over the planet. And now what Nehemiah is going to ask in just a few moments is for God to bring those people back from all over the planet, bring them back to their land, and that God would one day again bless them. I want you to notice that Nehemiah remembers there was an agreement and we broke our end of the agreement. But here's what I think is fascinating. Nehemiah is quick to point out his mistakes. Nehemiah is quick to point out the mistakes of his forefathers. He's not saying this is God's fault. He's saying, God, you gave us what we deserve. We broke your commandments. We broke your statutes. We broke your ordinances. This is the way of saying it. we broke it all. And God, we deserve what you gave us. You made a promise through Moses. Listen, y'all. And Nehemiah is saying, you promised that if we didn't hold our end of the bargain, that you would bring harm to us. And you did. Now listen for just a second. He's saying, God, I believe you are a God of your promises. And you also promised that if we will return to you, if our hearts will return to you, that you will return to us and that you will, you will bless us. And God, just like you promised to hold us accountable if we did wrong, you also promised to do good to us if we did right. And today, God, I'm claiming that promise. Nehemiah is a man that is desperate for God's help because Nehemiah realizes without God, we're hopeless. I'm going to change things up, but I've been thinking about this. It's been heavy on my heart. When stuff started to change in our country late last week, I started to really hurt for the people of our community that are just 
barely hanging on by their financial fingertips. Talking about those kind of people that really are just living paycheck to paycheck right now. They don't have that fully funded emergency fund. So if something happens that changes their finances, they're not going to be able to pay the bills. I want you to picture this in your mind because I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. But I want you to think about how these things might play out in just a moment. The school district decides to close schools for the next three weeks. But you're a single mom who has an hourly paycheck at a business that if you don't show up to work, you don't get paid and there's nobody who can stay home and take care of the kids. So now do the math for just a second. I don't get paid for the next three weeks because I have to stay home and take care of my children and I want to stay home and keep my family safe for the next three weeks. But I only make enough money that we eat next week based on what I bring in this week. We can't pay the rent next week. We can't pay the utility bill next week if I don't go to work. And I can't go to work for the next three weeks. I can't tell you how financially catastrophic this could be the first week of April for families that are living paycheck to paycheck which is tens of thousands of families in the Chattahoochee Valley right now. And what they need to know is that God's people are aware of their challenges. What they need to know is even if they're not connected to this church or to a church, God's people care about their challenges, that God's people are going to do something to try to meet those needs. Now, obviously, a church like us can't possibly step in and rescue all of the people that are about to become this financially stressed, but we can do something. And I want you to start to pray, God, cause us to be people that do something. Not just the people that are living paycheck to paycheck. But there are entire industries in our country that are about to go through immense strain. In fact, entire companies that may go bankrupt if this thing continues for a long time. And what we need to do as the people of God is have a heart like Nehemiah to be aware of what's happening and to just simply care about what's happening. And then to say, God, I don't know how much I can do, but with whatever I can do, I am going to do something. Nehemiah is a man that has a heart of prayer. He's a man that, that starts to ask God, God, would you hear my prayer? And then finally, Nehemiah is just going to make a bold request of God. And finally, he's going to ask God, God, would you heed my prayer? Here it is. I'm putting it all on the line, God. I'm going to come to you, and I'm going to call you to account. I'm going to ask you for something big. And by the way, let me remind you, this isn't a one and done prayer. Because Nehemiah says, I am broken and in prayer day and night over the people of Jerusalem that I've never met before. They don't come to my church. I don't even know who they are, but I know they're struggling. So Nehemiah goes to the Lord, and he's about to make a really big request. And I just want you to know, I separated these last verses from the rest of his prayer on purpose because I want you to hear the request that Nehemiah makes of the Lord. I want you to picture it this way. God, if you don't step in and do something, I'm in big trouble. Because God, I'm about to make a big request of my boss. I want you to think for just a second. Anybody in this room ever ask in prayer, God, I'm about to go ask a big request. I'm going to ask my boss for a pay raise. I'm going to ask my professor to give me some grace on this midterm exam that I just totally bombed, and I'm about to fail the class, and I'm about to lose my scholarship. God, I, I'm going to ask my parents for a big request, and I'm not sure how it's going to go. So, God, I'm not asking for a favor from you. God, I'm asking for your favor on me as I go and ask this request. You want to know the difference between asking for a favor and asking for God's favor? It's Nehemiah is about to step in and to do something. And he wants to know, God, will you be there? Will you make sure that you've got my back when I go make this bold request? So here's the bold request that Nehemiah makes. Starting down in verse 11. Please, Lord, 
Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants, Israel, who delight to revere your name. Here's the request. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. Nehemiah is about to go to his boss and Nehemiah is about to make a really bold request of his boss. And Nehemiah is saying, God, I need your favor because I'm about to go ask something. Listen, that may cost me my life. And Nehemiah tells you what his role is. At the time that I made this request, I wasn't a prophet in Israel. I wasn't a priest with all of the authority that goes along with that title in Israel. I certainly wasn't the prince of Israel and going to inherit the land by going and making this request. It's right up here on the screen. When I'm going to go make this request, when I'm about to do this thing, God, Nehemiah's job at this point is what? I'm the king's cupbearer. Now, if you don't know what this title means, it basically means that Nehemiah, somebody reminded me of this this week, Nehemiah was putting his life on the line every day, all day long for the king. Nehemiah was the guy who said, there's a lot of people that want to kill King Xerxes. He's the most powerful man on earth right now. And their way of trying to kill him would be by poisoning his wine. So my job is to drink the wine and make sure I don't fall over dead. And if I don't fall over dead, then I let the king drink the wine. That's what Nehemiah does every day, all day long. Nehemiah is in the presence of the king. And Nehemiah is about to go make a bold request of the king. And Nehemiah says, it really doesn't matter what the king thinks, how the king answers this request. God, if you don't grant me favor, this thing isn't going to go down. It's not going to work out. But God, if you're in this, if you're on my side, God, if your hand of blessing and favor is on this, then I believe you can control the heart of the king. Nehemiah is a great example of what God can do through people that are totally surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Would you look up here for just a second? Our challenge, like Nehemiah's challenge, is to get up tomorrow and to, according to the words of the New Testament, die daily to self. To say, God, I'm not in charge anymore. I stopped being in charge of my life when Jesus Christ stepped in and took over. He's now in charge of my life, which means he can send me wherever he wants to send me. He can do with me whatever he wants to do with me. I don't get a chance to call the shots anymore. I drink the cup that the king gives me to drink And if I live, I live. And if I die, I die. It's not mine to decide anymore. I lost that authority. I gave away that control when I put Jesus as the king of my heart. And what you and I have the challenge to do tomorrow is what Nehemiah had to do every day. He had to get up in the morning and decide, I'm not calling the shots in my life. It's not mine to decide. It's up to the Holy Spirit to decide where I go and what I do next. And Nehemiah is a man totally surrendered to the Lord. Here's the point of this whole passage today that I hope hits you hardest this morning. Nehemiah prays in total brokenness before the Lord. God, it's my fault that those walls are in rubbles in Jerusalem. Now, I want you to think about this because you and I should say, wait a second, Nehemiah, why are you confessing your sin when you live 70 years later and 900 miles away? Why are you saying it's your fault, Nehemiah? Because it seems like it's somebody else's fault and you had nothing to do with this. And Nehemiah is admitting what all of us in this this room would have to admit collectively, God, maybe I didn't do the thing that caused the walls to fall down. Maybe I just didn't do anything to stop it. In fact, if it was today, Nehemiah might say, God, I didn't cause the problems in this city, but I also didn't step up and do anything to stop it. In fact, here's what I did, God. I kind of expected the mayor to fix it. I wanted the city council or I wanted the budget to fix the spiritual problems in this city. And there are great spiritual problems in this city. 
But if Nehemiah were standing before us today, he would say, I realize that the mayor can't fix these problems. The city council, no amount of money can fix spiritual problems. No, it's going to be spiritual people that are going to have to fix spiritual problems. And our city has deep spiritual problems. So Nehemiah falls on his knees and says, God, it's my fault too. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. But I'm, I'm guilty because I'm part of the collective family of faith. And y'all, a church that is that has a heart for the city and a heart for God will be a church that responds very much like Nehemiah responds. Every week I'm going to try to point this out. You see from the word Nehemiah on the screens that Nehemiah is a God, a guy who believes he, God, is going to have to intervene, but I, God, is going to do it through me. This is the two cities that we represent, the, the city of God and the city of man, this earthly city that is a mess, and we belong to this eternal city, and we're going to make a difference in this earthly city until God calls us home from this eternal city. So I'm going to wrap up with this. Here's what Nehemiah does. He places his life on the line, and he certainly knows what he's about to do because Nehemiah probably saw this with his own eyes, from another Jew, a young Jewish girl by the name of Esther, who's married to this king, whose people, Nehemiah's people, are in trouble. And Esther says, well, somebody's going to have to step up and somebody's going to have to do something. But when Esther's challenged about it, Esther says, do you realize, Uncle Mordecai, if I go to the king uninvited and if I make a request of him, he has the right to kill me instantly. So here's what I need you to do. You and all of my faithful friends, all of my friends. Uh, my family. I need you to pray and I need you to fast for me because I'm about to go into the king's presence and I'm about to ask something of him. Nehemiah has probably watched this happen and watched Esther, this bold queen, make a request of King Xerxes. And now Nehemiah is about to make a bold request of the same king. And Nehemiah knows if he doesn't uh, extend his favor to me, I'm going to die when I make this request. But if I don't make this request, my people have no hope, so I'm going to make the request. And God can take care of what happens next. This week, as I was studying this passage, the Lord really started to show me something about my own heart. He started to show me, Jeff, sometimes you can get yourself so busy. Jeff, sometimes you can get yourself so focused on other things that the problems around you don't impact your heart. They can't impact your heart because you're too busy and too focused on other things. And then he started to show me, the Holy Spirit started to reveal to me, Jeff, if you really want a heart like Nehemiah's, it's going to hurt because I, the Lord, am going to have to till up the soil of your heart a little bit. It's become hardened by how busy and how focused you are on other things. And if you really want to focus on this community, I'm going to have to till up the soil and break up the hard heart a little bit so that my spirit can penetrate and start to put in your heart the same desires that Nehemiah had in his heart. And when God showed me that this week, y'all, it hurt. And I started to realize maybe I don't have a heart like Nehemiah, so maybe I'm not praying the kind of prayers that Nehemiah is praying because my heart is a little bit hard. And maybe what I need this morning is for God to break up the hardness of my heart. I'm going to pray for us in just a second. I want to challenge you as I do this. We say uh, we want you to do something to put into practice what you're hearing from the Bible. And maybe your heart isn't connected to the heart of God. Maybe today you need to surrender to King Jesus for the first time. Maybe you need to have a heart transplant. If that's you, we're going to pray for you in just a second. But maybe you're saying, I don't have that heart for my city. God, I want to have that heart for my city. So I'm going to ask you, if you're physically able, will you join me in fasting one meal a day, every day between now and Easter yes. for the people of our city that are broken and in need of a Savior? They just don't know it, and they need somebody to come to them and to show them 
the difference that Jesus Christ can make. We're going to be a church that's going to reach out, and I'm going to invite you over the next few weeks to reach out on our campus and in our community to invite people to come and to worship with us in Easter. We're planning on such a big service that we're going to move from this space to the two spaces next to us, and we're going to worship in the second and third spaces of this room to make room for all the folks that are going to show up with us on Easter. But more than anything else, we're not asking for a big crowd. We're asking for God to move in a big way on Easter Sunday. So will you bow? Will you let me pray for us right now? And will you respond to what you're hearing from Nehemiah and from the Holy Spirit this morning? Father, you showed me, and it was hard for me to hear, but you showed me this morning that I don't necessarily have the heart that Nehemiah has. Because I've allowed myself to get too busy and I've allowed myself to be pulled in too many directions. And when I did that, I stopped noticing what was happening around me. And then God, as I started to allow you to work in my heart, and I'm just going to be honest, it hurt for you to work in my heart a little bit this week. God, when I started to allow you to work in my heart, you started to help me to see those single families who win the Muskogee County School District, just shut the schools down, may have totally devastated these families financially. And right now they're trying to figure out how on earth am I going to feed my children? How am I going to be able to pay the rent next month if I don't go to work? And God, now I'm seeing the needs around me, and quite honestly, I'm a bit overwhelmed by it. And not just me, but your people in this room. So God, would you give us the heart of Nehemiah? Would you give us the ability, the willingness to have a tender heart, a white hot heart, and because it's white hot, we pray these bold prayers that God, you would move through this church, you would move through your people, you would make a massive impact in the Chattahoochee Valley over the next few weeks as people's lives are turned upside down because of this virus. But Father, really? More than anything else, my prayer has been over the last couple of days that you would bring somebody into the doors of this church because we chose to meet today. You would bring somebody in today who needed to have a heart transplant. They have a heart of stone, a heart that they can't fix. And they're realizing today that they need you to do heart surgery on them, to take that heart of stone out and to place your heart inside of them. They need to surrender to you for the first time. So maybe they're tuned in watching on Facebook Live right now. Maybe they're in this room. God, would you cause somebody right where they're sitting, watching this on their device or in this room to say, God, I'm a sinner. I cannot fix my heart. It's something that requires a miracle from heaven. I believe you didn't leave me in my sin that you were willing to go to the extreme of even sacrificing your son, Jesus, as payment for my sins. You are willing to do that for me, to purchase me back from my sin and to give me a new heart. God, though they took that man's body off of the cross and laid it in a tomb, he didn't stay there. Three days later, to demonstrate that he has the power of God, he came back out of the grave alive. And now all of us who call on his name have that resurrection power that the Holy Spirit put on display on Easter morning. We have that available to us. And so, God, I'm asking you to do a miracle inside my heart right now. Father, I'm asking you to change me and make me into a new man or a new woman. God, would you do that? Would you do what only you can do right now? And God, we will give you all of the credit for it. In Jesus' name, amen.